Okay, so one of the things that every Muslim has to believe is we believe in angels. No, they don't look like that. And those aren't angels, they're cherubs anyway, according to uh, whatever. So, okay, so what are, the summon, what, what are some of the common beliefs uh, about angels that religious people hold? Generally in religions, generally, yeah? What do people believe about angels? Does anyone know? Yes, sister. They see everything. Huh? They see everything. Okay, yeah? Any religion, it says. Any, anyone who believes in angels, what do they believe in? Yeah, they're creatures. No, I don't think anyone believes they're actual people, right? So, yeah. They're guardians. They're guardians. You have guardian angels. Yeah. On the day of judgment, they speak for you. On the day of judgment, they speak for you. Yeah. Big feathered wings. Big feathered wings. Yeah. They protect you. Every person has one. Every person. Yeah, the guardian angel. We're talking about a guardian angel here, right? Yeah. Huh? They're all good. Are they? Yeah. They've got halos. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, okay, so I mean, that's some iconography that, you know, is in people's minds. They're not all good, right? Like, not according to Christianity. Right? In Christianity, who's the devil? A fallen angel. Right? So in Christianity, there is a battle. But not only the devil, by the way. The devil has with him, according to... Jewish and Christian tradition, right? He has with him an army. Right? There's an army of rebellious angels. It's not just the devil, right? There's a whole army. And they're having some like major battles, right? Um, so it's interesting. You find in many different religions, uh, ancient religions, there is a belief in angels, a belief in winged creatures, they perform certain tasks for the gods and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, they're, they're not like us. They're not like human beings, right? So you have in different religions different beliefs. Obviously, in Christianity, there is the idea that angels can fall. Have you, have you also heard the story of Harut and Marut? Yeah? The Harut and Marut are mentioned in the Qur'an. But there's a story about them which is reported from the Israeliyat. And the point being is that this contradicts what we believe in Islam. But again, it's the, uh, it's the idea of the fallen angels. These two angels are complaining about the immorality of people on earth. So God sends them down as human beings. And then they realize how difficult it is not to fall in love. Yeah, And there's like made movies made about this, right? Okay. And, uh, you know, they fall in love and like it, it's supposed to be God teaching the angels how difficult it is to be a human being, right? So this is an old story uh, of Harut and Marut. But we don't believe this as Muslims, right? And why? Because what we believe about Muslims, uh, what we believe about angels as Muslims is very specific. So we have some real details, for most other people, it's just guesswork. There's some idea that these beings exist, but exactly what they are, what they do. Um, no, alhamdulillah, in Islam, it's very clear. So first of all, just as we, our origin is from clay. Like our, you could say our essence, our base, you know, um, origin is clay. And jinn, I think we'll talk about jinn and it will talk about jinn. Jinn are made from smokeless fire. Angels are created from light. Okay. Light, light. Not light bulbs, light, but from light. Yeah, nur, yeah, which means light. Yeah. Um, they exist and they're real. They're not figments of our imagination. Uh, the pagan Arabs, for example, believed that the angels were the daughters of Allah actually believe that they were God's daughters. So they believe that the angels were female, right? Um, but they're not the daughters of Allah. Okay, um, the, the angels have been created to worship Allah and carry out His commands. Okay, and Allah mentions this in the Quran. The angels glorify His praises night and day and they never slacken. So angels, for angels glorifying Allah, glorifying God, it's like breathing for us. 
like it's something they have to do and they can't stop doing it. They constantly are glorifying and praising God. And they are incapable of disobeying Allah. Angels are incapable of disobeying Allah. So, shaitan, Satan, the devil is not a fallen angel. Because angels cannot disobey God. Because their existence is to obey God, worship God, and carry out God's commands. They're incapable of disobeying God. Right? And Allah says in the Quran, the meaning of which is, they do not disobey Allah in what He commands them, but they do what they are commanded. Okay? They have wings. Uh, and um, Allah mentions in the Quran, He made the angels' messengers with wings, two, three, or four pairs. Some angels, like the angel Jibreel, who is the greatest angel, has 600 wings. They're not necessarily feathered wings though, right? We shouldn't, that's not, again, that's just like how people picture it. And angels can appear in human form. There are many, many, uh, uh, it's in the Quran, when the angels come to talk to uh, Ibrahim, Abraham, and they come to visit Prophet Lut um, as a precursor for the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, they, they appear as humans. Um, Jibril, as we know from the hadith of Jibril, this whole hadith is based upon uh, that. And, you know, the angels appear not only to prophets, they can appear to people. Even the Prophet wasallam said, when someone comes seeking charity from you, you know, don't refuse to give someone charity because you don't know that Allah sent you a messenger. There's a whole action, meaning it could be an angel that Allah has sent just to test you, right? Yep. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't, it wouldn't necessarily be obvious. Anyway, there's a, whole, there's a beautiful story, a hadith, uh, about uh, three men who have th three types of disabilities. I won't mention the whole thing. And um, an angel is sent to them to ask them, what do you want? And they each ask for different types of wealth. And they're given this type of wealth. And then the angel comes back uh, dressed as a poor person, in a time of you know, famine, and these people are wealthy, and he's asking them, you know, give me something of what Allah has blessed you. And they say, I can't give to every person who's asked, I'll have nothing left, right? And they say, well, they say, well, didn't Allah, weren't you like this? And Allah gave you that, right? May Allah take it away. And they just, except one guy who was blind, and he says, take whatever you like, you know, <laughs> right? Um, so, yeah, th so people, so th these things can happen, right? To ordinary people. The Prophet ﷺ, there's a famous narration uh, of um, Hanzala, uh, uh, one of the companions called Hanzala. He was really upset one day and he was going around saying, Hanzala has become a hypocrite, Hanzala has become a hypocrite. And, you know, and, and then Abu Bakr heard Hanzala saying this. He said, what are you talking about, Hanzala? He said, look, you know, when I'm with the Prophet wasallam." When we're listening to him giving his sermon on Friday, you know, we, we, we feel like the paradise is there, the hellfire is there, it's the day of judgment, we remember Allah so strongly. Then we go back to our families and we forget everything. We forget all of these things. And I, 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 I'm a hypocrite. How can I be like that? And so Abu Bakr said, Wallahi, the same thing happens to me. He said, let's go and ask the Prophet. So they went and asked the Prophet and he said, Oh, Hanzala, there's a time for this and a time for that and a time for this and a time for that. He said, Wallahi, if you are able to be in the state when you are listening to me, when you're at home and the rest of the time, the angels will come down and shake your hands on the street. Yeah. So um, angels, these are the angels. The other thing is the angels have intellect. They have the capability to... Think about things. And we can understand that from the story. Yeah. I don't know if it's... Uh, okay. We can understand that from the story that I'm sure... Uh, hopefully you know it in the Quran about uh, Adam and how Iblis disobeyed Allah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he created Adam and I'm, I'm cutting it all quickly, you know, and he told all the angels, I'm going I'm to create a khalifa, a successor for the earth. And they said, and then the angel said, are you going to create something that is going to make blood, uh, you know, that's going to shed blood and make mischief? So 
They have the ability to question. They have the ability to process information. They have the ability to think. Right? They didn't, they're, not, they're not saying this in a rebellious way. They're saying this in a way because they want to understand. They want knowledge and they want more information. Right? It means they have the ability. They want to understand why Allah is doing that. Because they think, well, we're, we're glorifying you. We're praising you. Right? They know that Allah has created everything. Right? So that everything should praise Him and glorify Him. So why would you create something that is going to, you know, shed blood and make mischief on the earth? And Allah says, I know what you don't know. So they, they accept it. You know, well, Allah says they accept it. Uh, and then Allah, he, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates Adam. And then He teaches Adam the names of all the things. And then He says to the angels, tell me their names. Meaning He's asking the angel... Angels to mention the names of the human beings and they don't know, right? And then he says to Adam, tell them, tell me, tell them names. So he names all the angels because Allah has taught Adam the names of all things. So, and Allah says, didn't I tell you that I know what you don't know? And the angels said, the angels just praise and glorify Allah and say, Allah, you, you know everything and you're the wise. And, you know, they, 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 like I said, they weren't questioning Allah out of disobedience. They're questioning out of curiosity, wanting to know. It shows and indicates they have like what you could call some type of intellect, right? Then Allah says, bow down before Adam. He tells all the angels to bow down before Adam, right? Some people, I'm going to preempt it, say, well, isn't bowing down something you only do for Allah? Yes, absolutely. It is something that you only do for Allah. You should not bow down to any created thing. To bow down or to prostrate before a created thing is shirk. Because it's an act of worship that should only be done for Allah. Right? So how about the angels bowing down? Can anyone answer that? Is that shirk? The, the God, Allah told the angels to bow down to Adam. Yeah? Why is it not shirk? Yeah? Because Allah commanded it. <laughs> exactly, it's that simple. Like, it's only shirk because Allah commanded it or Allah forbade it. Yeah? That's it. Like, it's because of Allah's command, not necessarily because of some, from His wisdom. So, yeah, they, so they all bow down except Iblis. And Allah mentions in the Qur'an, and Iblis was one of the jinn. So what are the jinn? The jinn are another creature. They're the only other creature that we know about, that, that we know about, that has free will. Angels do not have free will. Yes, they have some level of intellect. They have some ability to operate independently. They have an ability to operate independently. So, for example, there's a story, another uh, a thing the Prophet mentioned about a man who killed 99 people. And he wanted to repent. Uh, and so he went trying to find out if he could repent. And, and anyway, I'm, I'm going to cut this story a little bit short. And basically, a scholar said, "Yeah, you can repent, but you just need to leave this land, go to another land, uh, and, and you know, away from these wicked people. Go to a good place, and, and that's that's all you need to do." So the man left, and he died halfway. Right. So the angels of punishment and the angels of mercy were disputing which one is going to take him. One of them was saying, "No, he repented, and look, he made." He, he, look, he walked towards this good land and the other said he didn't do a single good deed, right? It means that it shows that the angels have some ability to act independently, right? They've been given commands and they go and fulfill those commands and they're having a discussion about who should fulfill a command how, right? Okay, so it shows they have some intellectual ability, right? Uh, so the jinn, the jinn is different in the sense that they are like us that they can choose to obey or disobey. So we have intellect, but we can disobey God. Angels can't. Right? We can know what God is telling us to do and still do something different. Angels can't do that. And the jinn are like that. Jinn are similar in the sense. And they're similar in many ways. They have children, they have communities, they have different religions. But they are not... Physical in the sense that we have is there what normally you call spirits. Yeah. Okay. And anyway, there's a whole lot of stuff around jinn and a lot of it we just don't know. Like it's not a lot of the stuff that people talk about jinn and the history of jinn. It's not something we know definitively 
from the Quran or from what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us. All we know is that this one jinn, yeah, this one jinn, Iblis, was amongst the angels in the heaven. How he got there? There's many stories. There's some stories we can't say definitively are they true or not. All we know is this one jinn, <coughs> Iblis, is with the angels, <coughs> and uh, he disobeys Allah. When Allah says prostrate, all the angels prostrate, but Iblis refuses. And then Allah says, why do you not prostrate when, you know, all, everyone is prostrating? And he said, well, I'm better than him. Yeah? You made me from my fire and you made him from earth. I'm better than him. And I'm not going to prostrate to something that you made from earth. Right? So Allah, then Allah expels, you know, shaitan from his presence. He said, there's no place for the arrogant here in my presence. He, and then Iblis says, give me respite. Let, leave me until the last day and I will misguide mankind from your straight path. Yeah, except those, your chosen servants, your believing servants. I will misguide all of them and take them with me to hell. And Allah says, okay, you have respite. You've been given respite. Okay, so that very briefly, you know, is the story of the fall, I suppose. Well, there's not the fall. Then Allah puts Adam and Hawa in paradise in Jannah. He says, eat and drink from wherever you like, except don't go near this tree. It's not mentioned what tree it is. It says, don't go near this tree. Shaitan, Iblis comes, he whispers <coughs> to Hawa, he whispers to Adam, he makes them promises, you know. Uh, and they listen to him and they eat from the tree and their nakedness appears to them. And then Allah expels them from paradise and puts human beings and Shaitan on earth. And that's where we are. Our testing for, you know, the descendants of Adam is the place of test. If we obey Allah and we follow the messengers, then we, inshallah, we will go back to paradise. If we don't, we'll go to hell with Iblis. So that's it. That's the real history, guys. Not that you evolved from a monkey. The real history is what I just outlined for you there. Okay. That's our true history. That's the origins of human beings. Yeah. Okay, so what are some of the benefits of believing in angels, right? Well, one of the things that it increases our awareness of the complexity, the subtlety of the creation of Allah, how there are so many things even beyond what we can normally observe. And it makes us understand the absolute strength and power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The, another thing that we can think about is that we never feel alone. If you're a believer, you always know that subhanAllah, the angels are with you. And you mentioned that uh, for him, each person, there are angels in succession before and behind him. They guard him by the command of Allah. So it is something that we believe that we have guardian angels, right? We have angels that guard us, right? Angels that are there to help us, angels that are advising us to do good. Just as I mentioned before, everyone has a kareem or a jinn that is encouraging them to do evil, right? Number three, it helps us to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amongst the angels, there are angels, one on our right, one on our left. The angel on the right writes all the good deeds. The angel on the left writes all the evil deeds. So all of these things, when you understand and you think about the reality of these beings as well, that constantly remember, I mean, just that thing, this realization that there are these countless beings that constantly worship and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a further reminder, Allah doesn't need you to be Muslim. You're not doing Allah a favor by praying five times a day. Like, what a joke. <laughs> you think you're going to go to... You know, to Mecca and make Hajj and you've done something amazing. There are angels, right? That are constantly, there are so many angels that Allah, above the Kaaba, there is another Kaaba in the heavens and the angels, they, uh, they make tawaf around it and they never return. And it's constant. There are so many angels, they make tawaf and they never return. The, actually, this is subhanAllah, the... the Universe is full of countless beings that are remembering Allah constantly, right? I mean, so we pray, we make hajj, we worship, 
because it's good for us. Not because Allah needs it. Yeah? <clears throat> Another beautiful thing is the angels, they pray for the believers, they make dua for the believers, they seek forgiveness for the believers. Yeah? Um, they support the believers in different ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was mentioned. For example, in battles, sometimes angels come and they help the believers and this is in, in, mentioned in the Qur'an and there's many stories, by the way, I could tell you many stories uh, from modern times where people have experienced extraordinary things, yeah? which inshallah almost definitely are the angels, right? So I told you the story of Iblis, right? Um, I told you the story of the, the fall of shaitan. So what we mentioned is that shaitan, what is his objective? His existence is dedicated to do one thing. And what is that one thing that he wants to do? Yeah? Take us to hell. He wants to take us with him to hell. That is his objective. And he doesn't give up. He's, you know, that's, he is just determined to do it, right? So one of the important things is you must have heard the adage, know your enemy, yeah? So it's good to know your enemy. Because this shaitan iblis is your enemy. He is your sworn enemy. Allah tells us, shaitan is your enemy. Do not take him as your friend. Don't take him as your friend. Don't invite him in for dinner in your head, yeah? Lay out a feast for him and have a long chat listening to everything, all the lies that he has to tell you. Like a lot of people do, right? He's your enemy. He is a liar. He is a deceiver. So the more you are connected with the Qur'an, the more you are connected with the book of Allah, the more you are connected with... The practice of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the easier it is going to be for you to identify these, you know, these voices from Shaitan, and to know what is the right way from the wrong way. Because one of the things I, I reckon possibly as a new Muslim, people may struggle with, like are these like voices in your head, right? I certainly I know when I was when I first became Muslim, Subhanallah. Some of the stuff that I struggled with, it was just crazy, really crazy. And actually, one of the things is shaitan, when you, when you first become Muslim, shaitan attacks you really hard because he knows you're vulnerable. He knows your knowledge is less. He knows in some ways you're weak in your knowledge. So he's going to work really hard to put doubts in your mind. He knows that you probably haven't Learn to discipline your soul, to discipline yourself that well yet, right? So he's going to stir up your desires, your passions, yeah? Remind you of all those good old things that you used to do back in the days before you became Muslim that you can't do anymore, right? He's going to remind you of all of that stuff. And he knows that maybe you don't have the, you haven't developed the skill set really to avoid it. So number one thing that shaitan wants to do, the top thing that he wants to do, is to get you to commit shirk. Because if he gets you to make shirk, he's got you. If you die making shirk, he's succeeded. You're going to be in hell with him forever. That's his number one goal. Right? Or to die making kufr, disbelief. So kufr could be slightly different from shirk. Right? So shirk, as we know, is making right, or we, we, you know, we, making associating partners, making partners with Allah, making rivals with Allah. As we've gone, we've described and we taught you what shirk is. Yeah? Kufr could be something different. So kufr could be saying something that is a disbelief. Like, for example, or doing something, desecrating the Quran. Yeah? Is disbelief. It may not be shirk, but it's disbelief. Yeah, There are certain things that you can say which are statements of kufr. It may not be shirk, but it is no one who believes in Allah and who believes in the Prophet wasallam, or someone who insults the Prophet. Insulting the Prophet is not shirk, but it, it, could, it could definitely be disbelief. It could take you out of Islam. Do you understand? Right? 
So this is what shaitan will try and get you to do. That's on the top of his list. If he can get you to do any of those things, that's it. He knows he's got you. So the next thing is, if he can't get you to do shirk or kufr, to make partners with Allah or to disbelieve in Allah, the next thing that shaitan will try to get you do, to do are innovations. Now, this is something that shaitan has really done a pretty good job. Because most Muslims don't even know what innovations are. They have no idea really. And a lot of Muslims are committing innovations, which are major sins. And here's the thing, why shaitan, you know why shaitan loves innovations? Because, okay, what is an innovation? What is bid'ah? What is it? Okay, yeah. Okay. It's an innovation, right? Is to do something or to believe something. To do something or believe something. That looks like or seems to be like something that is from Islam. It looks like it's from Islam. It looks like a religious practice. It looks like a religious belief. Right? It sounds like it. Looks like it. However, it is not proven. It's not proven by any verse of the Qur'an or by a practice of the Prophet or by an agreement of the companions. Right? Or a consensus of the Muslims. It's not, you don't find that. And this could be either the action itself or the way or the mannerism in which the action is done. So it's not just the action, it could be the way the action is done. Alright? So bid'ah simply means a new thing, in, bid'ah means a new thing, a newly invented thing. But obviously, a mobile phone is a bid'ah from the time of the Prophet Muhammad. But it's a technological bid'ah. It's not a religious bid'ah. It's a bid'ah, te- which is fine. Te- get as, be as, do as much bid'ah as you like when it comes to technology. Yeah? When it comes to worldly things, if you want to spend all of your energy inventing things, do it in worldly things. Make inventions. But when it comes to the religion, don't touch it. Stick to the sunnah. And the reason is, brothers and sisters, is because we can only know how to worship Allah through revelation. Let me ask you a question. How do you think people started worshipping idols? Huh? Huh? People got famous? Yeah? Okay, that's very general, but probably, huh? Innovation. Innovation. So like yeah, yeah, go on. Okay, so how is that an innovation? What's, where's the innovation? No one told us to make statues and pictures of prophets. No one told, God never told us to make statues and pictures of pious people, right? But that's what they did. And why did they do it? How might they imitate the religion? Right? How, how would you make that religious? Because remember, a, a bid'ah is something that seems to be like it's from the religion. You have to, that's the element. So where's the religious element? Why would, why would you build a statue of your pious people? Yeah? To remember them. Yeah? So, here I am thinking one day, oh, you know what, if I make a statue of, you know, well, I think, you know, of Prophet this or such and such person that, when we see their statue or picture, we'll see it and we'll remember them. Remember their good, you know, how good they were and how holy they were. This is how, this is what Abdullah ibn Abbas, who was a companion of the Prophet, he told us how idol worship started. He told us. He said, amongst the people of Noah, the people of Nuh, were upon the religion of Adam for 10 generations. So, there was a time when everybody on earth was Muslim. Right? Yes, there were sins being committed. 
Yes, there was Cain and Abel, right? And who killed? I think Cain killed Abel, right? Okay. So there were sins, there was disobedience, there were things happening, but no one was making shirk. No one was worshipping idols. Like this is for, we don't know how long, but the people of Nuh were on this for 10 generations. They were only worshipping Allah. And they had amongst them four pious people. Really holy, like really holy pious people. And these four people, they all died. One after the other, they died very quickly in succession. So you can imagine that these people, they were very attached to them. They loved them, right? These pious people died, right? And they were left without their scholars, without their pious people, right? And they were very distraught. This is one shaitan. Can you, this is how long shaitan's been really planning now. Now he realizes, here's my chance, right? So he comes to these people and he says, why don't, like he's suggesting to them in their mind, why don't you make statues? And why don't you make images of these pious people and then put them in your places of gathering so that when you see them, you will remember Allah more. Do you hear that? When you see them, you will remember Allah more. So shaitan is doing something that is going to help people remember God more. Remember that when someone says, oh, how can you say such and such is an innovation? We are just reading Quran. We are just doing, we are making dhikr. We are remembering Allah. Are you saying it's haram to make dhikr? No. We're saying this is not the way the Prophet did it. Why are you doing it in some way the Prophet didn't do it? Because this is how it starts. Innovations look like something good. They look like, oh yeah, this is a good thing. And this is why shaitan loves them. Because they destroy religion. And they lead to shirk. So shaitan comes, he says, put these statues. And they build these statues and that's it. He leaves them. He leaves them for a bit. Another generation, two generations, some generations passed. And what happens? What do you think happens to people when their scholars and their pious people die? And they're not, yeah? They, okay, but they also, they start to commit sins, right? There's no one reminding them. There's no one enjoying the right, forbidding the wrong. There's no one keeping them on the straight and narrow. People start, yeah, you know, getting a bit more relaxed about everything. Yeah? Okay? Bit by bit, people fall into sin. And when they fall into sin, right? When you start to fall into sin, then what begins to happen is your heart is not really connected to Allah anymore. And soon enough, people... And I've met many people like this, non-Muslims, who believe in God. But they believe, I've got so many sins and I've done so many bad things, I can't talk to God. I can't. How's God going to listen to me? Why would God listen to me? Uh, This is the whole of Catholicism is based on this false idea. Who do you think you are? You think you're going to go and ask God? I would say to the monks, the priests, why do I have to come to you and ask God to forgive my sin? Well, you can ask God if you want, but why would God listen to you? You need to come to the holy people. You need to come to the monk. You need to come to the one who's been purified. Like this whole thing is that, no, no, you can't have, you're so bad, right? God is not going to look at you. This is really, this itself is kufr. This is disbelief. Itself is disbelief. Allah says, only the disbeliever despairs of the mercy of Allah. Right? But this is the trick of shaitan. When people are so prone to committing sins, they feel that they can't. And so this is what happened. This is what happened. They became like that. And then shaitan said to them, you see these statues that your ancestors built of your pious people? The reason they did that is so that you could use them as intercessors and intermediaries between you and God. So you call upon these pious people, right? And they will take your prayers. They will be the, you know, they will be the intercessor between you and God. And you know, like people use this argument. You say, look, if you want to see the king, can you go straight up to the king and talk to him? Can you do that? No, you have to go to, you know, you have to write a letter. You have to go through all the secretary. And it sounds logical, doesn't it? Right? So the same thing they say with God. You, sister, just, just think, listen. Yeah, I'll come back to you. Right? They say it's the same thing. You know, you think you can't go straight to God. God's more holy than a king. 
you need to go through his special chosen people. Sounds very logical, isn't it? Does it does sound quite logical, yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you see? Even idol worshippers have some logic. However, it's logical maybe, but it's just it's based upon a completely it's actually based on disbelieving in God. Because this shows that people, these people don't know who they're talking about. They don't know who's God. Now, why does a king have a secretary? Why does a king have, uh, you know, people that like, yeah. he's Because he's a human being. He has limited time. He wants to eat feasts. He wants to go hunting. Yeah. He wants to go dancing with Kate, you know, and have an argument with Harry. Yeah. Okay, and pick a fight with Megan. You've got all that important stuff to do, yeah? Okay, yeah, you know, as a, as a, you've got all that important stuff to do. You can't spend all of your time talking to the commoners, right? And, uh, and all their, how, can you imagine? If every one of us had a problem, yeah? Oh, my sandal broke. Oh, um, Queenie, my sandal broke. Can you help me, please? Seriously? Do you, has she got time for that? No. Right, you wouldn't even think of asking the queen if your sandal broke, would you? Would you? Anyone? But you know what? The prophet said, if your strap of your sandal breaks, ask Allah. Even the strap of your sandal. Never be shy to ask Allah. Even in the strap of your... That's the difference. Because Allah can hear every single one of us calling upon Him... If every human being, the human of us, the jinn of us, the male of us, the female of us, the last of us and the first of us, gather together in one place and we all ask Allah, Allah could give us, all of us, everything we ask for and it wouldn't reduce His kingdom and His authority in the slightest. And if every one of us gathered together, the, the first of us, the last of us, the male, the female, right, the men, the jinn, we gathered together and we all rebelled against Allah. All of us rebelled against God. It wouldn't reduce His kingdom in the slightest. So do you see why people who say we need intercessors between us and Allah, they're actually making shirk. Because what are they attributing to God is the limitations of the creation. They're suggesting that Allah is limited. Like a king at for Allah. Is Allah like a human king? A pathetic human king? Right? Who's only got 24 hours in a day and can only listen to a few people talking to him in a day? Is Allah like that? Astaghfirullah. He's not. Right? So, brothers and sisters, you see how shaitan, he wants us to make these innovations. These innovations, they look like religion. They sound like religion. They may seem like really good things. And the problem is, once you think you're doing something like that, you think it's going to bring you closer to Allah, do you think you're going to stop it? You don't think you're going to stop it. You think, no, I, you know, this is a good thing. This is why shaitan loves it. But the Prophet ﷺ said, the worst thing in the religion are the newly invented matters. The Prophet ﷺ, he would say this again and again and again. He would mention it so many times. He would warn against innovation so much. What is enough for us is the sunnah. We, like, that's it. Most people can't even fulfill the sunnahs, let alone thinking of new ways to worship Allah that have not been done by the Prophet and his companions. A little bit of sunnah is better than a lot of bid'ah. But an, an innovation, brothers and sisters, it's a sin. It's a sin. It's a crime. I mean, this is a whole subject. I don't want to give any more time to it. But this is shaitan's trick. Get you to do innovations. If he can't get you to do that, he'll make you do major sins. Right? Because major sins are destructive. Fornication, stealing, lying, backbiting, slandering, yeah? Uh, breaking your oaths. Um, anyway, there's so many major sins, right? Uh, anything which Allah has threatened us, right, with the hellfire or the curse of Allah. If Allah has said the curse of Allah is on a person who does this or that, or Allah has threatened the punishment of hellfire, this is what scholars consider to be major sins. Some people say 
There are seven major sins. Some say there's 70 major sins, right? Because there's some hadith where the Prophet said the major sins are this, and he mentioned maybe four or five or six, seven things. But there's other hadith where the Prophet mentioned the major sins are this, and he mentioned some other things, right? So generally, major sins are considered to be anything that has a threat for that sin of hellfire or the curse of Allah. Again, major sins lead to innovations and shirk. Because when a person is immersed in these major sins, they can very easily begin to despair of the mercy of Allah. And you know, this is, this is the pathway. This is what it does. If, you, if shaitan can't get you to do major sins, he will still try and to get you to do minor sins. And what are minor sins? Minor sins are things that lead to major sins. Right? So I don't know what A.T. was saying to you, for example, before, right? But one of the things we have in Islam, right? is that um, we avoid uh, contact between the opposite sex, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, it's better for you, right, to get a hot, red hot poker and put it in your head than it is to touch someone who is not your, it's not permissible for you to touch, right? So if they're your mahram, like your, like for the brothers, it would be your mom or your aunt, yeah, or your sisters or your daughters, yeah, or your mother-in-law, right? You can hug them and kiss them and whatever, no problem, right? Okay, but someone who's not mahram, like your even your cousin, right? Okay, your sister-in-law, um, yeah, your sister-in-law or anyone who you're not married to is not from your immediate family, you're not supposed to touch them. Is it a major sin? No, it's not a major sin. Right? It is not a major sin. There's no threat of hellfire or the curse of Allah. Right, And it is something that if you do it, it is wiped out by your good deeds. Right, Please don't think though, however, that you just make it into nothing. Right, Because why? Because these things are gateways. The reason why the Prophet has prohibited them is because it's a door to something that's really dangerous. And shaitan doesn't give up. And this is one of the things about Islam, is that Islam tries to close the doors. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't just say, don't fornicate. It says, don't create a situation where that's going to be easy for you to do that. Right? So be careful how you dress. Be careful how you talk. Be careful how you interact. Yeah? Because there are doorways that lead to it. And it's not, I, you, you guys, come on, we know, right? We live in this society. Most of us come from Jahiliya, yeah? The bad old days. It didn't take much, doesn't take much, does it? So close the doors, guys. This is what Islam is saying. Take precautions, right? Don't even come close to it. When it comes to alcohol, the, the, it doesn't say just don't drink it. It says don't drink it, don't even, you know, carry it, don't sell it, don't buy it, don't transport it, don't even buy the grapes that people use to make it. Like there's a load of stuff surrounded by alcohol. It's not just don't drink alcohol. Even you should try not to sit on a table where alcohol is being drunk. Even that. Right? That's how you should keep away from it. So... Shaitan, these are some example of minor sins, right? You know, sitting where alcohol is being drunk is a minor sin. Why? It's a sin because it leads, it, could, it can lead to those bad things, right? Look, there may be times we can have a discussion. There may be times and circumstances, and like this is a big discussion, especially as reverts, we probably have to have it, right? Um, and I've asked scholars about this, right? We can maybe talk about it if you want in question and answers, right? But the point is, be careful of these minor sins. When we call them minor, don't think of it as, yeah, it's nothing. Because that's what shaitan wants you to do. Because sometimes a whole bunch of minor sins can actually end up being just as bad as a major sin. Because what happens? When you sin, a black, like a dark spot falls on your heart. I'm talking spiritually here, not a physical. <laughs> a dark spot. Because your heart is like, it, it, it's nur, Right? It's light. That light reflects the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When your heart is full of light, 
And the heart and the mind is what we mean, the mind. The heart, the mind is, is the same, right? It, it is inclined to obey God. It is soft. It is ready to obey Allah. But when the heart gets rusty and the heart gets hard, and what makes the heart rusty and hard are sins. Minor sins do that as well. Like if you keep looking at the opposite sex, you keep looking at guys, you keep looking at girls, right? You keep looking, even when you, you keep looking at movies, even you look at movies, right? You're still looking at stuff, right? You think you look at that stuff a lot. These, okay, it's not big sins. It's not. And maybe you'll say, oh, there's some benefit in it. And there probably is, right? Some of it maybe the... But you don't forget that you're looking at something you shouldn't be looking at, right? And that... And you know, who... Like these days, we don't even think about it, right? We don't even think about it. We see, this stuff is everywhere. We don't even think. But all of this, like the Prophet said... Uh, not, I don't think it's a hadith, but it's mentioned, I think the scholars mentioned that the glances, looking at the opposite sex, right? Those look, it's like the arrows of shaitan. Yeah? Not the cupid. Yeah? The arrow of shaitan. That's what shaitan uses to kill your heart, bit by bit. Yeah? These are the minor sins. Yeah? So they, they so what do you, anyway, so, even if shaitan can't get you to do minor sins, yeah, you're that good, mashallah. He still doesn't give up, right? What he will try to do is distract you with permissible things, but those good deeds have a less reward, yeah? So let's say, for example, oh, I'm going to go to the retreat, yeah? And I'm going to learn the foundations of my deen, alhamdulillah, right? Here I am, and you know, we're sitting here and we're learning. Shaitan is going to come and he's going to, what he's going to distract you? He knows you want to do something good, but he'll try to find you something else to do. It's still good, but it won't be as good as important as the deed that you, you know. Oh, maybe like pray to Hajjid all night, yeah? Pray to Hajjid all night. Pray all night long in the d depth of the night, in the last third of the night. And he will encourage you to do it. Why? So you miss Fajr. He'll get you to do extra things, but make you miss your obligations. What do you think is better? To pray all night or to pray Fajr? Yeah, Fajr is better. It's better you sleep all night and you pray Fajr than you pray all night and you miss your Fajr. Because the Fajr is an obligation. Do you see? But Shaitan will fool you even with this stuff. He doesn't give up. Do you see how he doesn't give up? Right? This is Shaitan. Okay, we'll have a little bit more about shaitan after the break. Sorry I went over time a bit.